Hi guys, let's start chapter number 6 that is peasants and farmers. In the previous two chapters, you read about pastures and forest and about those who depended on these resources. You learned about shifting cultivators, pastoral groups and tribals. You saw how access to forests and pastures were regulated by modern governments and how these restrictions and controls affected the lives of those who used these resources. In this chapter, you will read about peasants and farmers with a special focus on three different countries. You will find out about the small cottagers in England, the wheat farmers of the USA and the opium producers of Bengal. You will see what happens to different rural groups with the coming of modern agriculture. What happens when different reasons of the world are integrated with the capitalist world market? By comparing the histories of different places, you will see how these histories are different, even though some of the processes are similar. Let us begin our journey with England, where the agricultural revolution first occurred. So... Now we will first come to England. So the coming of modern agriculture in England. On 1st June 1830, so on 1st June 1830, a farmer in the northwest of England found his barn and haystack reduced to ashes by a fire that started at night. In the months that followed such in the months that followed cases of such fire were reported from numerous districts at times only the rick was burnt at times only the rick was burnt at other times the entire farmhouse then on the night of 28th August 1830, a thrashing machine of a farmer was destroyed by laborers in East Kent in England. In the subsequent two years, riots spread over southern England and about 387 thrashing machines were broken. Through this period, farmers received threatening letters urging them to stop using machines that deprived workmen of their livelihood. Most of these letters were signed in the name of Captain Swing. Alarmed landlords feared attacks by armed bands at night and many destroyed their own machines. Government action was severe. Those suspected of rioting were rounded up. 1,976 prisoners were tried. Nine men were hanged. 505 transported. Over 450 of them to Australia and 644 put behind bars. Captain Swing was a mythic name used in these letters but who were the swing rioters why did they break thrashing machines what were they protesting against to answer these questions we need to trace the developments in england in english agriculture in the 18th and 19th centuries so let's find out about the swing rioters. 1.1 The Time of Open Fields and Commons Over the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the English countryside changed dramatically. Before this time, in large parts of England, the countryside was open. It was not partitioned into enclosed lands privately owned by landlords. 
Peasants cultivated on strips of land around the village they lived in. By the beginning of each year, at a public meeting, each villager was allotted a number of stripes, uh, a number of strips to cultivate. Usually, these strips were of varying quality and often located in different places, not next to each other. The effort was to ensure that everyone had a mix of good and bad land. Beyond these strips of cultivation lay the common land. All villagers had access to the commons, so they had a common land. And all villagers had access to the commons. Here they pastured their cows and grazed their sheep, collected full wood for fire and berries and fruit for food. They fished in the rivers and ponds and hunted rabbit in common forest. For the poor, the common land was essential for survival. Here's a source. The threatening letters circulated widely at the times the threat were gentle, at others severe. Some of them were as brief as the following. Sir, this is to acquaint you that if your thrashing machines are not destroyed by you directly, we shall commence our labours, signed on behalf of the whole swing. So, this is one of the threatening letters being sent to the landlords so it supplemented their meager income so for the poor the common land it supplemented their meager income sustained their cattle and helped them tide over bad times when crops failed in some parts of England, this economy of open fields and common lands had started changing from about the 16th century. When the price of wool went up in the world market in the 16th century, rich farmers wanted to expand wool production to earn profits. They were eager to improve their sheep breeds and ensure good feed for them. They were keen on controlling large areas of land in compact blocks to allow improved breathing. So they began dividing and enclosing common land and building hedges around their holdings to separate their property from that of others. They drove out villagers who had small cottages on the commons and they prevented the poor from entering the enclosed fields. So we have another another source, source B. The swing letter is an example of a sterner threat. Sir, your name is down amongst the black hearts in the black book, and this is to advise you and the like of you who are to make your wills. Ye have been the black god enemies of the people on all occasions. Ye have not yet done as ye oath. So swing. So this is a letter, threatening letter. Uh, till the middle of the 18th century, the enclosure movement proceeded very slowly. The early enclosures were usually created by individual landlords. They were not supported by the state or the church. After the mid-18th century, however, the enclosure movement swept through the countryside, changing the English landscape forever. Between 1750 and 1850, six million acres of land was enclosed. The British Parliament no longer watched this process from a distance. It passed 4,000 acts legalizing these enclosures. Here's a map. Figure 1. Threshing machines broken in different, in different counties of England during the Captain Swing movement, that is from 1830 to 32. 
So in here, different thrashing machines were broken. 1.2. New demands for green. Why was there such a frantic effort to enclose lands? What did the enclosures imply? The new enclosures were different from the old. Unlike the 16th century enclosures that promoted sheep farming, the land being enclosed in the late 18th century was for green. So it's for green. Green production. The new enclosures were happening in a different context. They became a sign of a changing time. From the mid-18th century, the English population expanded rapidly. So the population expanded. Between 1750 and 1900, it multiplied over four times, mounting from 7 million in 1750 to 21 million in 1850 and 30 million in 1900. This meant an increased demand for food grains to feed the population. Moreover, Britain at this time was industrializing. More and more people began to live and work in urban areas. Men from rural areas migrated to towns in search of jobs. To survive, they had to buy food grains in the market. As the urban population grew, the market for food grains expanded, and when demand increased rapidly, food grain prices rose. So there was inflation. By the end of the 18th century, France was at war with England. So, by the end of the 18th century, we have France was at war with England. This disrupted trade and the import of food grains from Europe. Prices of food grains in England skyrocketed, encouraging landowners to enclose lands and enlarge the area under green cultivation. Profits flowed in and landowners pressurized the parliament to pass the Enclosure Act. Here is another figure, figure 2, annual average wheat prices in England and Wales, 1771 to 1850. So annual average wheat prices, so it shows the average wheat prices. Uh, we have Bussell, a measure of capacity, shillings and English currency. 20 shillings is equals to 1 pound. Here is another figure. Figure 3. Suffolk countryside in the early 19th century. This is a painting by the English painter John Constable, 1776-1837, to son of a wealthy corn merchant. He grew up in the... Suffolk countryside in East England, a region that had been enclosed much before the eight, before the 19th century. At a time when the idyllic countryside was disappearing, the open fields were being enclosed. Constable painted sentimental images of open countryside. In this particular painting, we do see some fences and the separation of fields, but we get no idea of what was happening in the landscape. Constable's paintings usually did not have working people. If you look at figure 1, you will see that Suffolk was surrounded by reasons where threshing machines were broken in large numbers during the Swiss riots. So, here is the painting. Uh, then we have 1.3, the age of enclosures. There is one dramatic fact that makes the period after the 1780s different from any earlier period in English history. In the earlier times, rapid population growth was most often followed by a period of food shortages. Food grain production in the past had not expanded as rapidly as the population. In the 19th century, 
This did not happen in England. Grain production grew as quickly as population. Even though the population increased rapidly, in 1868, England was producing about 80% of the food it consumed. It, the rest was imported. So England was able to grow 80% of the food it consumed. This increase in food grain production was made possible not by any radical innovations in agricultural technology but by bringing new lands under cultivation. So it was not because of any agricultural technology but it was because of bringing new lands under cultivation. Landlords sliced up pasture lands carved up open fields, cut up forest commons, took over marshes and turned larger and larger areas into agricultural fields. So this is how the food grain production was able to match up with the rapidly increasing population of England. So we have a figure here. This is a map. Enclosures of common fields by parliamentary acts, 18th to 19th centuries. Farmers at this time continued to use the simple innovations. So during this time, they still used the simple innovations in agriculture that had become common by the early 18th century. It was in about the 1660s that farmers in many parts of England began growing turnip and clover. They soon discovered that planting these crops improved the soil and made it more fertile. Turnip was moreover a good fodder crop released by cattle. So farmers began cultivating turnips and clover regularly. These crops became part of the cropping system. So turnip and clover became part of the cropping system. Later findings showed that these crops had the capacity to increase the nitrogen content of the soil. Nitrogen was important for crop growth. Cultivation of the same soil over a few years depleted the nitrogen in the soil and reduced its fertility. By restoring nitrogen, turnip and clover made the soil fertile once again. We find the farmers in the early 19th century used much the same method to improve agriculture on a more regular basis. Enclosures were now seen as necessary to make long-term investments on land and plan crop rotations to improve the soil. So what they do is that enclosures, so it was a necessary for long-term investment on land and the second one is plan crop rotations to improve the soil. Enclosures also allowed the richer landlords to expand the land under their control and produce more for the market. 1.4. What happened to the poor? So earlier we were talking about the rich. Now let's see what happened to the poor. Enclosures filled the pockets of landlords. But what happened to those who depended on the commons for their survival? When fences came up, the enclosed land became the exclusive property of one landowner. The poor could no longer collect. So the poor could no longer collect their firewood from the forest or graze their cattle on the commons. They could no longer collect apples and berries or hunt small animals for meat, nor could they gather the stalks that lay on the fields after the crops were cut. Everything belonged to the landlords. Everything had a price which the poor could not afford to pay. In places where enclosures happened on an extensive scale, particularly the midlands and the counties around, the poor were displaced from the land. So, the poor were displaced from the land. 
They found their customary rights gradually disappearing. Deprived of their rights and driven off the land, they tramped in search of work. So, they search for work. From the Midlands, they moved to the southern counties of England. This was a reason that was most intensively cultivated and there was a great demand for agricultural laborers but nowhere could the co but nowhere could the poor find secure jobs but they couldn't find any secure jobs earlier it was common for laborers to live with landowners they ate at the master's table and helped their master through the year doing a variety of odd jobs by 1800 this practice was dis was disappearing laborers were being paid wages and employed only during harvest time so laborers were being paid wages and they were employed only during harvest time as landowners tried to increase their profit they cut the amount they had to spend on their workmen work became insecure employment uncertain and income unstable so what happened was that work became insecure and employment uncertain and income unstable for a very large part of the year the poor had no work we have source c one peasant who lost his right to common land after the enclosures wrought to the local lord should a poor man take one of your sheep from the common his life would be forfeited by law but should you take the common from a hundred poor man's sheep the law gives no redress the poor man is liable to be hung for taking from you what would not apply you with a meal okay the poor man is liable to be hung for taking from you what would not supply you with a meal and you would do nothing illegal by depriving him of his subsistence what should be the inference of the poor when the laws are not accessible to the injured poor and the government gives them no redress okay very meaningfully he said 1.5 the introduction of thrashing machines during the not during the napoleonic wars prices of food grains were high so during the napoleonic war prices of food grains were high and farmers expanded production vigorously fearing a shortage of labor they began buying the new thrashing machines that had come into the market they complained of the insolence of laborers their drinking habits and the difficulty of making them work the machines they thought would help them reduce their dependence on laborers after the napoleonic wars had ended thousands of soldiers returned to the villages they needed alternative jobs to survive but this was a time when grain from europe began flowing into england prices declined and an agricultural depression set in so but this was the time when grain from europe began flowing into england and the prices declined and uh, and an agricultural depression so there was an agricultural depression uh, see prices in figure 2 Anxious landowners began reducing the area they cultivated and demanded that the imports of crops be stopped. They tried to cut wages and the number of workmen they employed. The unemployed poor tramped from village to village and those with uncertain jobs lived in fear of a loss of their livelihood. The Captain Swing riots spread in the countryside at this time. For the poor, the thrashing machines had to become a sign of bad times. So, for the poor, 
thrashing machines had become a sign of bad times. Source D. In contrast, many writers emphasize the advantages of enclosures. There can be no question of the superior profit to the farmer of enclosures rather than open fields. In one case, he is in chains. He can make no changes in soil or prices. He is like a horse in team. He must jog along with the rest. A uh, conclusion. So, let's read. The coming of modern agriculture in England thus meant many different changes. The open fields disappeared and the customary rights of peasants were undermined. The richer farmers expanded grain production, sold this grain in the world market, made profits and became powerful. The poor left their villages in large numbers. Some went from the Midlands to the southern counties where jobs were available, others to the cities. The income of laborers became unstable, their jobs insecure, their livelihood precarious. Now let's come to the next topic. Bread basket and dust bowl. Now let us travel across the Atlantic to the USA. So we first discussed about the uh, the, the changes in the agriculture uh, in England. Now let's come to USA. Bread basket and dust bowl. So now let us travel across the Atlantic to the USA. Let us see how modern agriculture developed there, how the USA became the bread basket. So, USA became the bread basket of the world and what this meant to the rural people of America. At the time that common fields were being enclosed in England, at the end of the 18th century, settled agriculture had not developed on any extensive scale in the USA. Forest cover over 800 million acres and grasslands 600 million acres. Figure 5 will give you some idea of what the natural vegetation was like at the time. So, figure 5. This is the figure 5. We can see forest vegetation, tall grass, short grass, desert vegetation. So, uh, figure 5. Forest and grasslands in the USA before the westward expansion of white settlers. Adapted from Becker, Agricultural Reasons of North America, Economic Geography, Volume 2, 1926. About half the forest cover and one-third of the grasslands were cleared for agricultural settlement. In the map, you can also see the location of the various Native American communities in the early 19th century. Most of the landscape was not under the control of white Americans. Till the 1780s, white American settlements were confined to a small, narrow strip of coastal land in the east. If you travel through the country at the time, you would have met various Native American groups. Several of them were nomadic. So most of the natives, they were nomadic, some were settled. Many of them lived only by hunting, gathering and fishing. Others cultivated corn, beans, tobacco and pumpkin. Still others were expert trappers through whom European traders had secured their supplies of beaver fur since the 16th century. So still others were expert trappers through whom European traders had secured their supplies of weaver fur since the 18th century. In figure 5, you can see the location of the different tribes in the early 18th century. Here we have another map. Figure 6, the agricultural belt in the USA in 1920s, adapted from several, uh, adapted from several 
essays by Becker published in Economic Geography in the 1920s. So we have wheat area, corn belt, hay and pasture region, corn and wheat belt, cotton belt, subtropical coast. Okay. By the early 20th century, this landscape had transformed radically. White Americans had moved westward. So the white Americans had moved westward and established control up to the west coast, displacing local tribes and carving out the entire landscape into different agricultural belts. The USA had come to dominate the world market in agricultural produce. How did this change come about? Who were the new settlers? How did the spread of cultivation shape the lives of the Indian groups who had once lived there? 2.1 The Westward Move and Wheat Cultivation The story of agrarian expansion is closely connected. The story of agrarian expansion is closely connected to the westward movement of the white settlers who took over the land. After the American War of Independence from 1775 to 1783 and the formation of the United States of America, the white Americans began to move westward. By the time Thomas Jefferson became president of the USA in 1800, over 700,000 white settlers had moved on to the Appalachian Plateau through the passes. Seen from the East Coast, America seemed to be a land of promise. Its wilderness could be turned into cultivated fields. Forest timber could be cut for export. Animals hunted for skin, mountains mined for gold and minerals. But this meant that the American Indians had to be cleared from had to be cleared from the land. Okay. Uh, here here is a figure, figure seven. The westward expansion of white settlement between 1775 and 1920. So, at first, at first only this area, this area was where the white settlers lived. Then it expanded. In 1830, it expanded to this area. Then, after that, they occupied the east area and also the west coast and by 1920s the white settlers occupied the whole of USA so uh, in the decades after 1800, the U.S. government committed itself to a policy of driving the American Indians westward. So they moved or they drove away the American Indians westward, first beyond the river Mississippi and then further west. Numerous wars were waged in which Indians were massacred and many of their villages burned. The Indians resisted, won many victories in wars, but were ultimately forced to sign treaties, give up their land and move westward. As the Indians retreated, the settlers poured in. They came in aggress in successive waves. So, they came in successive waves. They settled on the Appalachian Plateau by the first decade of the 18th century and then moved into the Mississippi Valley between 1820 and 1850. They slashed and burned forests, 
pulled out the stumps, cleared the land for cultivation and built log cabins in the forest clearings. Then they cleared larger areas and erected fences around the fields. They ploughed the land and sowed corn and wheat. So they sowed corn and wheat. So here's a figure. Figure 8. Sort houses in the frontier. A typical sort house that settlers lived in when they began clearing the grasslands. Timber for houses was not available in this area. So we have sort. Pieces of earth with grass. In the early years, the fertile soil produced good crops. When the soil became impoverished and exhausted in one place, the migrants move the migrants would move further west to explore new lands and to raise a new crop. It was, however, only after the 1860s that settlers swept into the great plains across the river Mississippi. In subsequent decades, this region became a major wheat-producing area of America. Let us follow the story of the wheat farmers in some detail. Let us see how they turned the grasslands into the bread basket of America, what problems they faced and what consequences followed. So let's see the next part in my next video. So that's all guys. See you in my next video. Bye.